Hello guys, this is the third video of our receivable series. In this video, I'll be talking about loan receivable. A loan receivable arises from a loan granted by a bank or other financial institution to a borrower or client. A loan receivable is initially measured at fair value plus transaction costs. Fair value is normally the transaction price, whereas transaction costs pertain to direct origination costs. Take note that indirect origination costs are expensed outright. Subsequently, a loan receivable is measured at amortized cost. Origination fees are those incurred for the creation of a loan. They may be either chargeable or not chargeable to the borrower. Origination fees received from the borrower are accounted for as unearned interest income and recognized as interest income over the term of the loan. Direct origination costs not chargeable to the borrower are offset against origination fees received from the borrower. Indirect origination costs, however, are expensed outright. Hence, the initial carrying amount of a loan receivable is computed as follows. Principal amount less origination fees received from borrower and direct origination costs equals initial carrying amount. When origination fees received from borrower exceed direct origination costs, the amortization of the unearned interest income will increase interest income. On the other hand, when direct origination costs exceed origination fees received from borrower, the amortization of the difference will have the opposite effect of decreasing interest income. Consequently, the presence of origination fees requires us to compute for an effective interest rate that will equate the present value of cash flows to the initial carrying amount. I will discuss this in more detail later. Here is a sample illustration with journal entries. Origination fees received from borrower is credited to unearned interest income and direct origination fees is offset against or debited to unearned interest income. Since origination fees received from borrower is higher, the amortization will result to an increase in interest income. The initial carrying amount of our loan receivable is computed as follows. Principal amount 5 million pesos less origination fees received from borrower 331,800 pesos add direct origination costs incurred 100,000 pesos equals 4,768,200 pesos. Subsequently, a loan receivable is measured at amortized costs using the effective interest method. Had there been no origination fees, our effective interest rate will simply be the nominal interest rate. But because we do have origination fees, we now have to compute for the effective interest rate that will equate the present value of the cash flows to the initial carrying amount. If the initial carrying amount is greater than the principal amount, the effective interest rate must be lower than the nominal interest rate. If the initial carrying amount is lower than the principal amount, the effective interest rate must be higher than the nominal interest rate. This rule makes sense when you have a proper understanding of the time value of money. Recall that the lower the discount rate, the higher the present value, and the higher the discount rate, the lower the present value. If you find this confusing, please do take time to review time value of money. In our sample problem, since the initial carrying amount of 4,768,200 pesos is lower than the principal amount of 5 million pesos, the effective interest rate must be higher than the nominal rate of 12%. To compute for the effective interest rate, we can either use trial and error or interpolation. Using interpolation, the effective interest rate is computed as follows. First, we choose any two discount rates greater than 12% say 13% and 15%. It is important that we choose discount rates that are not too far apart. Second, we compute the present value of cash flows under each discount rate. Take note that we use lump sum PV factor for the principal and ordinary annuity PV factor for the interest received. Take note as well of the computation for interest received, which is principal amount times nominal rate. Third, we get the absolute difference between the present value and the initial carrying amount. Then finally, we use the following formula. The formula should give us the effective interest rate of 14.01% or 14%. A loan receivable is subsequently measured at amortized costs. 
In preparing the amortization table, we should arrive at the principal amount of 5 million pesos since this is the amount we expect to collect on the loan. Each year, our present value grows by 14%. Interest income is computed as present value times effective interest rate. Moreover, each year, we receive interest payment of 600,000 pesos computed as principal amount of 5 million pesos times nominal rate of 12%. Observe that each year, the interest income is higher than the interest received. The difference is the amortization, which is added to the present value until we arrive at the principal amount of 5 million pesos. The interest income in the last year served as the balancing figure to force the present value to 5 million pesos. Here are the journal entries. The amortization is recorded as a debit to unearned interest income and a credit to interest income. Let's proceed to impairment. Under Pass 39, an entity shall assess at every end of the reporting period whether there is objective evidence that a financial asset or a group of financial assets is impaired. The following loss events may indicate objective evidence of impairment. Impairment occurs when the carrying amount is greater than the present value of cash flows. The difference is recognized as impairment loss. Take note that the carrying amount of the loan includes any accrued interest receivable. Moreover, the expected cash flow should be discounted using the original effective interest rate. Subsequently, the interest income is computed as present value times effective interest rate and charged to the allowance for loan impairment. Here are the journal entries. Past 39 has been superseded by PFRS 9 financial instruments. One of the notable changes introduced in PFRS 9 is the shift from incurred loss model to expected credit loss model in accounting for impairment. The expected credit loss or ECL model under PFRS 9 is a forward-looking model that requires entities to consider past, current, and future information in recognizing credit losses. The ECL model under PFRS 9 results to an earlier recognition of credit loss than the incurred loss model under PAS 39, which recognizes credit loss only when a loss event has occurred. The ECL model is not yet included in your qualifying exam, but I have decided to include a brief overview here so that we can all be updated with the latest accounting standard. Under the general approach of the ECL model, an entity must determine whether the financial asset is in one of three stages in order to determine both the amount of expected credit loss to recognize as well as how interest income should be recognized. Stage 1 is where credit risk has not increased significantly since initial recognition. For financial assets in Stage 1, entities are required to recognize 12-month ECL and recognize interest income on a gross basis. This means that interest will be calculated on the gross carrying amount of the financial asset before adjusting for ECL. For simplicity, a financial asset is considered in Stage 1 if it has a low credit risk threshold equivalent to an investment grade. Stage 2 is where credit risk has increased significantly since initial recognition. When a financial asset transfers to Stage 2, entities are required to recognize lifetime ECL, but interest income will continue to be recognized on a gross basis. The rebuttable assumption is that financial assets which are 90 days past due are considered in Stage 2. Stage 3 is where the financial asset is credit impaired. This is effectively the point at which there has been an incurred loss event under the PAS 39 model. For financial assets in Stage 3, entities will continue to recognize lifetime ECL, but they will now recognize interest income on a net basis. This means that interest income will be calculated based on the gross carrying amount of the financial asset less ECL. And those are all for loan receivable. Let me remind you once again to review the concept of time value of money to truly understand both notes receivable and loan receivable, particularly the computation of amortized costs using effective interest method. As always, please leave your questions and comments in the comment section of my Facebook post. We just have one more video left. Hang in there!